1993, the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers exploded onto television in the United States, kicking off a pop culture phenomenon that has earned billions of dollars for Saban Entertainment, Disney, Hasbro. It seems like a no-brainer now. However, nearly 10 years before that, in 1984, the fight to not only make something like Power Rangers earlier, but to make it part of the Marvel Universe was led by a three-person team. Comics legend Stan Lee, television and film producer Margaret Lesh, and me. Hi, I'm Dan Larson, and this is the History of Sun Vulcan. Thank you to Surfshark for sponsoring this video. Use code TOYGALAXY to get 83% off plus three extra months for free. Surfshark is a virtual private network or VPN. Use it as an app, use it as a browser extension, use it to make the internet think your device is in another country while you sit in your country. Access and unblock websites and content that are normally region specific. Don't be lulled into a false sense of security. Incognito mode isn't enough. Surfshark actually encrypts your data for extra security when you're online. It keeps all of your personal information safe and your browsing activity hidden. What's his secret? Where does he get all those wonderful toys? Surfshark won't tell. The digital geography of the planet has been carved up into so many pieces that it's hard to be sure what you will or won't be able to see online. Take out the guesswork. Access your accounts from public Wi-Fi connections without fear of compromising your identity. With Surfshark, you can make it look like your computer is in another country by changing your location. Beyond that, your Surfshark account is yours to take wherever you decide to go, any device, anywhere, including that country you were making it look like your device was in. Use Surfshark on as many devices as you want to log in on. Access the content you've already paid for and watch it when and where it's convenient for you. Use code TOYGALAXY to get 83% off plus three extra months for free. Surfshark offers a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there's no risk to try it out for yourself. Click the link in the description below to get started today. That's code TOYGALAXY for 83% off and three extra months. Thanks again to Surfshark. Taiyo Sentai San Barukan or Solar Squadron Sun Vulcan was a single season of 50 episodes that ran from 1981 to 1982 on Japanese television. It was the fifth installment of the Super Sentai series of Japanese superhero TV shows that would eventually be adapted into the Power Rangers in the United States. A victory, but at what cost? Sun Vulcan is a three-man team of superheroes established to combat the threat of the evil machine empire called Black Magma. Led by Fuhrer Hell Saturn, Black Magma has developed the ability to create devastating natural disasters, produce armies of cybernetic soldiers, and horrible mass-shifting monsters of all types. Hell Saturn announced his presence to a United Nations summit after destroying a submarine and the subsequent search plane that ventured too close to his secret Arctic fortress. The assembled national representatives immediately unanimously agreed to create and fund Sun Vulcan in response. Response. Commander Daizaburo Arashiyama, robotics expert, restaurateur, and zookeeper, was selected to lead the team. Three members were recruited, the best Air Force officer, the best naval officer, and the best army ranger that the UN's Guardians of World Peace had to offer. The three heroes were provided with color-coded, animal-themed battle suits that enhanced their physical abilities. Corresponding codenames Eagle, Shark, and Panther, a giant transforming robot, motorcycles, a variety of specialized weapons, and the training to use it all. In retaliation to that, Hell Saturn orders his Black Magma troops to attack Sun Vulcan's shiny new base before they are fully operational. But Sun Vulcan wins the day, forcing Hell Saturn to take a more unconventional step to expanding his power. With a fully assembled might of evil attempting to destroy all nations and subjugate every living creature, Sun Vulcan must utilize the greatest powers that humans have ever created to defend the sky, the seas, the earth, and all those who call this planet home. They are the only hope, the only thing standing between life and total darkness. The Super Sentai or Super Squadron series is part of a larger genre of Japanese television movie productions called tokusatsu. Science fiction, monsters, superheroes, and robots are all prominently featured, but the hallmarks of tokusatsu are the prodigious use of costumes and practical special effects. Tokusatsu as a genre in Japan found enthusiastic mainstream appeal with the success of the Godzilla franchise as early as the 1950s. Through the 60s and 70s, tokusatsu characters like Ultraman, Kamen Rider, and Go Ranger would become so popular that they would spawn their own multi-generational franchises. Go Ranger, the first Super Sentai series, hit the air in 1975, establishing many of the elements that would become commonplace in the series. Five multicolored heroes, an evil force with a seemingly endless supply of minions and a new monster to fight each week, super weapons, theme songs, heroic posing, and the ability to sell comic books, magazines, and toys. 
After two seasons of Go Ranger, the Super Sentai series was refreshed with a playing card theme for Jaka Dengeki Tai in 1977 that absolutely bombed. Super Sentai producer Toei Company took a year off in 1978, while another superhero took center stage. Across the Pacific Ocean, Marvel Comics was looking for ways to reach markets outside the United States, through comics, through toys, through television and movies. In 1978, Marvel and Toei swapped licenses on some of their characters within their respective markets. Marvel got Combatler V and Dangard Ace, which they featured alongside another Japanese property, Ray Dean, in their comics as the Shogun Warriors. Toei got the crown jewel of the Marvel Comics library, the amazing Spider-Man. Stan Lee, one of the core creative forces behind the creation and popularity of Marvel Comics, was actively engaged in developing Marvel properties for television and film. In 1977, Marvel brought Spider-Man to American television sets as a live-action series for the first time. While it never ran for a full season with a regular time slot, it was popular enough to get 13 episodes produced from 1977 to 1979. More importantly, it was big in Japan, given its tokusatsu appeal. Marvel's man in Japan, Gene Pelk, made the connection with Toei. Toei was given the freedom to reinterpret Spider-Man as they saw fit for the Japanese market. Change his secret identity, change the origin of his powers, give him a giant robot. Spider-Man was a huge success on television, and more importantly, in the toy aisle. It convinced Toei that giant robots were where the real Super Sentai money was to be made. You're probably asking yourself, is this real? What I think you mean is, is it canon? Yes, on both accounts. <laughs> The Shogun Warriors were a part of the Marvel Universe proper. If the license hadn't expired, they might still be there today. And this version of Spider-Man has been featured in the comics during and after the Spider-Verse event in 2014, and is rumored to be in the next Spider-Verse movie due out in 2022. After Spider-Man, Marvel and Toei collaborated on two more series, 1979's Battle Fever J, a very loose interpretation of a team of international Avengers, which featured a Captain Japan, if you will, flanked by captains from the Soviet Union, Kenya, France, and America, and 1980's Denshi Sentai Denjiman. Taiyo Sentai Sun Vulcan was the fourth and final collaboration between Marvel and Toei. In and of itself, it wasn't that much of a departure from what came before it. In fact, thanks to the inclusion of Queen Hedrian, it is a direct sequel to Denjimon, the only time in the history of Super Sentai that two seasons have been connected by a continuing story. Denjimon was a team of multicolored superheroes imbued with the technological powers of the ancient Denzi people. See, 3,000 years ago, the Vader clan invaded and devastated the world of Denzi Star. The Denzi denizens managed to relocate an island called Denzi Land to Earth, where their descendants would wait for the eventual arrival of the Vader clan. Denjimon was a ratings and toy sales bonanza. Toei obviously wanted to build on that success, but where to take it? A second season of Denjimon? Could they get everyone back? Would they be able to refresh the characters, the designs enough to please the real critics? The kids asking their parents to buy the toys. Ultimately, Toei opted to create an entirely new concept with some carryover. Initially called Plasma Man, they settled on Sun Vulcan after being unable to secure the name Plasma Man. The new theme was air, sea, and land with red eagle, blue shark, and yellow panther suits. Some episodes touch on previously existing concepts of the Denzi descendants, but aside from the resurrection of Queen Hedrian, the majority of the series proceeds as though it is a unique creation unassociated with the previous material, like Phil Coulson on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Sun Vulcan was both a refinement of the Super Sentai formula and a break from it. Previous teams had five members, Sun Vulcan only three. Previous teams had at least one female member. Sun Vulcan was all dudes except for Commander Arashiyama's daughter, Misa. This did not go over well with fans. While Misa is a highly valuable member of the team and even makes an appearance as her alter ego, White Rose, she never gets a proper Sun Vulcan battlesuit, codename, or seat in the giant robot. Spider-Man was the first to bring a giant robot to the fight, a trend that continued with Battle Fever J, but Sun Vulcan was the first to have a combining giant robot, a trend that would continue through today. Sun Vulcan sold a lot of toys. Their iconic giant robot Vulcan Robo in multiple scales, their iconic giant robot transport vehicle Jaguar Vulcan in multiple scales, highly articulated four and a half inch die cast action figures of Eagle, Shark, and Panther. 
Four inch Star Wars style action figures, their base, their Jeep, model kits, wind up toys, role play accessories, gashapons, soft vinyl. If kids were playing with it, if it could be licensed with Sun Vulcan, they made it. Sun Vulcan characters and logos appeared on clothing, puzzles, coloring books, stickers, whistles, candy, chopsticks, dishes, cups, handkerchiefs, and honestly, internet, if you have pictures of any of these things, post them now because there ain't much out there. A Sun Vulcan movie was released in July of 1981 at the Toei Manga Matsuri Film Festival the same day episode 24 aired. I say movie because it's the same runtime and follows the same general format of the regular TV series. If anything, it's essentially a 51st episode. 1981 was also the year that Stanley officially moved to Los Angeles to work with Marvel Productions, the film and television development arm of Marvel Entertainment Group. Stan had a lot on his plate, but Sun Vulcan fired his imagination. He loved what the Japanese creators did with Spider-Man and thought Sun Vulcan had everything a show needed to really knock American kids on their butts. Costume superheroes, giant robots, monsters, action, comedy, horror, suspense. In a 1983 interview, Gene Pelk, Marvel's man in Japan, described the process by which they could easily translate the Japanese program for a US audience. Quote, he can sell it as is with a new voice track or take the prints and cut out the parts where Japanese actors appear, which is about one third of the film, and reshoot that with American actors and cut back to show the special effects and opticals and visuals, thus creating a series that looks American. Try as he might to sell it, every network said no. In 1984, Marvel Productions brought in Margaret Lesh as the new president and CEO. Formerly the executive vice president of Hanna-Barbera, she had the knowledge and experience to take over Marvel Productions' management team. With Lesh's arrival in 1984, Stan tried again to bring Sun Vulcan to the US. She described one particular meeting with Stan, quote, Stan brought me this video and said, Maggie, I think this is a hit. You need to look at it. I thought it was funny and different, but it was in Japanese. I called Stan and said, Stan, it's in all Japanese. He says, I know, but isn't it great? Marvel Productions produced some of the most important American pop culture film and television series of all time. Spider-Man, Spider-Man and His Amazing Friends, Dungeons and Dragons, G.I. Joe, A Real American Hero, Muppet Babies, Transformers, My Little Pony, Rude Dog, and The Dweebs. To say they knew what they were doing when it came to children's entertainment would be a gross understatement. With a budget of $25,000, Lesh and Marvel assembled a presentation trailer complete with English dubbed voices to try to communicate even a fraction of the enthusiasm Stan the Man Lee was feeling about Sun Vulcan. Like an eight-year-old watching real live superheroes fight real live monsters, dazzled, captivated by everything transpiring on the television, unable to avert his gaze. Johnny, there you are. So you found Hoppy? It's dangerous on this mountain. That tape, of course, is currently considered lost. In July of 2020, a three minute clip was uploaded to the internet archive that purports to be a segment from that pilot. The scenes are from episode 41, and while it is possible that it's from the presentation tape, I'm highly suspicious of its origin story. If you or someone you know has the actual tape, please reach out. Every network they showed it to passed. Two four and they said, I can't believe you're pitching this stuff. How could you show me this crap? It's terrible. It's cheesy. It's violent. It's outrageous. It's junk. <laughs> Lee and Lesh saw what the networks couldn't see. As she put it, quote, it was nothing like what was on television. Stan and I liked the cheesiness. I thought it was funny and that kids would like it. What kid wouldn't want to turn into a superhero? I can tell you that she was right because I was the target audience. I was the eight-year-old kid in 1984 whose life would have been consumed by Sun Vulcan in America because I had already experienced it in Japan. My family moved to Japan in the summer of 1980. Despite speaking no Japanese whatsoever, the second half of Denjiman was a fully engaging television program for the discerning four-year-old that I was. Colorful, dazzling, terrifying, mesmerizing. At five years old, I got to not only watch the entirety of Sun Vulcan, but to witness the flood of product onto store shelves, live the anticipation from week to week. I saw performances in real life twice, once on stage and once at a mall. I watched Vol Eagle with my own eyes jump off a soda machine and kick a black magma soldier in the face. Vol Shark, my favorite character from Sun Vulcan, gave me a free record of the theme song and an autographed picture of the team. I accidentally walked into the makeshift backstage area and Vol Panther said, hey kid, you're not supposed to be back here. Probably, it was in Japanese, so I'm not totally sure, but I'm getting chills thinking about this right now because to me, these guys were real. It was serious business and no criticisms of the bump set spike finishing move can possibly convince me otherwise. I was Stan Lee's enthusiasm personified. We moved back to the US in 1983, at which time I showed the episodes we recorded on beta tapes to every one of my friends who slept over. We would wear our winter scarves and leap off the couch, ninja kicking black magma lamps. 
Sun Vulcan could have been just as big in 1984 as Power Rangers ultimately was in 1993, but more than that, it could have been part of the Marvel Universe the way Shogun Warriors and Toei's Spider-Man are. It breaks my pop culture heart because the licensing deal that almost brought my childhood heroes back home with me is the same deal that prevents them from ever coming here in the future. In 1985, Marvel relinquished the rights to Sun Vulcan to Super Sentai and they were promptly scooped up by Saban Entertainment. From that point on, Sun Vulcan evolved on two separate timelines in two separate international media markets. In Japan, Sun Vulcan would appear in the first episode of Kosoku Sentai Turbo Ranger in 1989, a clip show celebration of 10 previous Super Sentai. In 2001, for the 25th anniversary of the Super Sentai franchise, they appear in the Hyakuju Sentai Gao Ranger vs. Super Sentai movie. In 2011, their powers, costumes, and giant robot appear in the 35th series anniversary celebration season Kaizoku Sentai Go Kaiger, again in 2017 for the 40th anniversary, and most recently in 2021 as part of the 45th anniversary season Kikai Sentai Zen Kaiger. In the US, things played out differently. After Saban acquired the rights to Super Sentai in the United States in 1985, he would go on to do the same thing Stan Lee and Margaret Lesh had done with Sun Vulcan, except this time the person who would make the call on greenlighting the series was Margaret Lesh. In 1990, Margaret Lesh joined the Fox Network developing their Fox Kids programming. In 1992, she was looking for a Saturday morning show with some action and humor. Saban showed her a presentation tape he made with Chodenshi Bioman footage from 1984. She recognized it immediately, mentally winked at Stan Lee, said this is for the kids like Dan Larson, probably, and the rest is history. They pulled footage from the most recent Super Sentai series, 1992's Kyoryu Sentai Ju Ranger, and within two years made billions in toy sales. The last chance for Sun Vulcan to make an appearance in the US was in 2014, when Saban's Power Rangers did their best to adapt Kaizoku Sentai Go Kaiger, the 35th anniversary series. A major element of the Go Kaiger team is being able to transform into Super Sentai costumes from every previous series going back to Go Ranger in 1975. While many pre-Mighty Morphin Power Rangers characters are shown, Sun Vulcan is not. Likely due to licensing issues related to Marvel Comics' involvement with Sun Vulcan, efforts are made to eliminate their appearances. One shot specifically removes Vol Eagle and replaces him with the original Red Ranger. Sun Vulcan has been erased from existence in the U.S. Since 2018, the Power Rangers franchise has been owned by Hasbro. As of this video, they have adapted 2012's Tokume Sentai Go Busters as Power Rangers Beast Morphers in 2019 and 2020, and 2019's Kishiru Sentai Ru Soldier as Power Rangers Dino Fury in 2021. In March of 2021, Hasbro reaffirmed their commitment to Power Rangers as a key franchise in their portfolio. They emphasized their intent to develop a robust Power Rangers shared universe and transmedia storytelling experience. Movies, television, animation, the works. It is highly unlikely that Sun Vulcan, or a US version of it, will play a role in the future of the franchise outside of Japan. A 40-year-old series with questionable rights potentially involving Marvel and Disney is a fight Hasbro does not want. For now, fans will have to rely on VPNs, bootleg DVDs, and random uploads to YouTube to navigate around the tangled waters of international licensing and media rights management enforcement to keep Sun Vulcan alive, a tribute to heroes like Stan Lee, Margaret Lesh, and me. <laughs> What'd we do? Thanks for watching. Please hit like, hit subscribe if you're not already a subscriber. Thank you very much to those of you who already are. If you haven't heard, we started streaming on Twitch. Find us twice a week at twitch.tv slash toygalaxy. If you're in the position to help the channel grow, please visit our Patreon or become a YouTube channel member. Please share this video and let us know in the comments down below if you have my Sun Vulcan belt and Vulcan stick from that picture of me when I was five lovingly caressing my God Sigma figure. I loved that Sun Vulcan belt so much that I wore it to school one day. I wasn't allowed to wear it during class, so my teacher made me hanging on the coat hooks with everyone's backpacks. Of course, in the bustle of leaving school that afternoon, I left it there, and when I came back the next day, it was gone. If you or someone you know has any information that might lead to the recovery of my Vulcan stick belt and badge, please let me know in the comments. I still have the God Sigma figure. I'd like to have my belt as well. <laughs> this is the face I'm making in that picture. <laughs>